Thank you so much uh, for being here. A number of you, of course, saw me over in e not too long ago in EB1, but I also know some people just joined now, so welcome. And uh, good morning to everybody. And uh, you know, I'll start the keynote session uh, because we have people joining now again by acknowledging that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract the land promised to the six nations that include six miles on each side of the Grand River. Um, as you know, the Future Forum is a new event organized by the School of Planning uh, here at the University of Waterloo. And as I mentioned earlier today in the networking, it builds on the accomplishments of many years of the Pragma Council's work. And again, thanking those who are here today from that. Uh, the intent is to provide time and space to learn, debate, and critically investigate ways in which emerging societal developments might impact our communities, considering topics from as diverse as public interest, from a diversity of public interest perspectives. I think we emphasize the public interests as a plurality, because foundationally, of course, as we know, right, planning as per its own professional code of ethics, aims to be re responsive to and represent a diversity of interests in making decisions about the future of our communities. The event is part of the school's larger academic mission to enhance student learning experiences via strong ties with the profession and uh, provide opportunities for faculty and students to debate, debate and disseminate knowledge um, and engage with the profession uh, actively. The event also builds on the Faculty of Environment and the University of Waterloo's strategic objectives to conduct transformational work that deals with some of the most pressing, pressing issues of our times. Now, the university president, Vivek Gurl, was hoping to give opening remarks today, but unfortunately is actually traveling in the UK at the moment um, and was, sends, his, um, sends his regrets. Um, he did want to pass on a message and asked me to read this. So Vivek Gurl, our university president, notes, our world is rapidly, rapidly urbanizing with economic opportunities and essential services being concentrated in urban areas we are faced with significant challenges to provide food housing and security to the growing population of city dwellers however this trend also presents exciting prospects to develop innovative solutions to persistent and urgent issues such as healthcare affordable housing transportation and climate change to ensure local communities prioritize the needs of people we require solutions that leverage technological and scientific, as well as political, economic, and planning expertise. Emphasis added on my part on that last one. <laughs> um, at the um, University of Waterloo, Vivek Girl notes, we are reimagining unconventionally by developing these solutions at the intersection of technology and sustainability. It gives me great hope that this inaugural Futures Forum in the School of Planning, we're helping empowering existing and new leaders such as yourself to advocate for progress, innovation, and justice in our communities. So that's from Vivek Girl, and uh, you know, I thank him for, for sending along that note. Um, at this point, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Bianca Wiley. Uh, Bianca Wiley is a writer with a dual background in technology and public engagement. She's a partner at Digital Public, where she works on public interest technology governance, and she's a co-founder of Tech Reset Canada, where she works on public engagement in innovation policy. Bianca worked for several years in the tech sector in operations, infrastructure, corporate training, and product management. Then, as a professional facilitator, she spent several years co-designing, delivering, and supporting public consultation processes for various governments and government agencies. She founded the Open Data Institute Toronto in 2014 and co-founded Civic Tech Toronto in 2015. Bianca's writing has been published in a range of publications, including the Boston Review, Vice, the Globe and Mail, and Toronto Life. She is currently a member of the advisory board for the Electronic Privacy Information Center and the Computational Democrat Democracy Project. She, she is also a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance and Innovation. Um, please join me at this point in welcoming Bianca Wiley for the keynote. 
speech is yours. Thank you. And I just want to know how to get to my slides. I don't know how to get to there. There we go. Is that me? Yes. Perfect. Sorry I had to meet you with yelling. Sorry, sorry, not sorry, one of those ones. That's a little facilitator uh, background. So as Marcus kindly sets up the, thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you for the kind welcome. Um, that was long. I've learned through the pandemic, I'm doing like half time work right now. So <laughs> each of the things that I do, I'm doing very little of every week. Um, if there's one thing that you take away from the next 45 minutes, um, I would hope it's that we have to respect each other's work to do good collective work. So I'm setting this nifty timer here at 45 minutes. See that red, see it? This is, this is about accountability. This thing is really loud when it's done. Okay, and I promise this. And I got like a double one if we wanted to take this really seriously. And I could give it to you, but this is our first encounter, so let's just start with the one. Um, the reason this really matters is people like Marcus, Jonathan, Jenna, I don't know if they're in the room right now, have spent weeks and months and others preparing for our time together today. And we always have to remember to respect what you can't see with labor, right? We're not just here right now. There's a lot of work that came before and there's a lot of work that we're gonna do together after. So I just wanna say, firstly, I'm the most excited about what's gonna happen after I'm done talking, which is working with all of you. That's why we're here today. And I also wanna thank Marcus and everyone else for convening and creating this space for us. So like, thank you for all the immense amounts of work. <laughs> um, just a note on the pandemic, uh, we are still in one. You might have seen the World Health Organization's announcement that the emergency element of this is over as per their uh, guidance. However, um, I don't think we have, maybe everybody here has had a different experience, but I think we need to acknowledge that people have lost family, they've lost caregivers, there's orphaned children, there's people dealing with new disability. Um, and frankly, I'm exhausted. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm also surprisingly tired on days, and I don't know why, and I think it's because I haven't quite grieved what we're living in. And I don't know where we put that, but I think it gives us a good window to think through some of the planning conversations we're gonna have. Um, on a personal note, I wasn't always raw, raw public institutions before the pandemic, but I was you know, closer to that than not. I think what I saw in the pandemic was an incredible lack of ability to be pluralistic in how we address a societal problem, which means not everybody's gonna wanna do the same thing. Not everybody's gonna wanna get vaccinated. I know people who are not vaccinated. The people who aren't vaccinated have lots of different reasons for that. They still live where I live and they're not going anywhere. Same with masking, okay? So I'm sharing this with you because I think it's a very important current example of the need for us to be pluralistic and create conditions where even if you don't like or agree with what other people are doing, and even when it impacts you negatively, you still gotta live with them. And this is a country, and this country makes me very upset sometimes because you couldn't have it better than creating a place where I hope in the future, we're talking about the future today, millions of people can come live here because of the things we've done historically to make them flee where they live now. So this is a bit intense, that's really why I do this work, is because I think Canada needs to raise up, and we see that work locally, I think. You know, that's, that's what we do, that's work we all do together. So when I'm talking about pluralism, that's a really good example of what I mean. How do we make it so it, it works for lots of people who don't agree? Um, the other quick note I wanna make here is, I came late to understanding disability justice in my career. Wow, is there a lot to learn from the people who do disability advocacy? And I think I was in a technology policy meeting a couple years ago, and I explained to them how through the accessibility movement, we basically edited the hard infrastructure of our cities because we decided that that was something we had to do. I think we need to think about that editing capacity again with our institutions as they stand and our governments and our self-governance. How do we increase our capacity for equity? Um, these are th possible things and it's gonna take us, I'm gonna just keep picking 50 years. I'm gonna be dead working, you know, I'm gonna work till I'm dead and it won't be done. So I think we all need to have the humility of the pace of this kind of change. 
I'm also gonna talk about flying burritos. So that was like an intense piece of this. Um, I'm gonna talk about drone delivered burritos too. And we need to, no one's laughing, that's fine. Um, okay, you might need permission to laugh. We need to be able to cycle between things that are heavy and things that are light. Because if you're walking around heavy all the time, you sometimes freeze, you sometimes can't, and you're sometimes too tired. So we're gonna move in and out of there. I just wanna make sure that um, what we're living in right now isn't minimized, because I think pretending it's not there is making us tired. So let's try to talk about it more together. Um, just a quick book recommendation. Anybody heard about this book? My friend Matthew Claudel, he's a planner. Incredible book about um, lots of things, but exciting things happening in engineering and exciting things happening in um, lots of different spaces, including the notion of crypt time. I don't know if anyone's heard that before. But um, I think one of the hardest things for us to do is to move at the pace of kindness, which is so much slower and so much more inefficient than the pressurized pace that we're working at right now, for most of us. You wanna build strong relationships so you can move fast in a crisis, you gotta do that slowly. You wanna build coalitions, you gotta do that slowly. Like these things take time. So this is a fantastic book. Just, th these are the kinds of things that I can't do this justice, but I just wanna make sure I, I point to things that are longer and better. So I'm not gonna read these right now. I just wanna put them up to say we'll revisit them at the end. But the, the title of this talk is The Art of Living Well Together. And I'm sharing some of the questions that I ask myself every day with you to see if they resonate or are useful for you. They may not be. I'd love to know what everybody else's sort of map and North Stars look like, um, but we'll come back to this. So how we're gonna spend the time here is I'm gonna talk a little bit about public engagement and democracy at like a high level, and then the same for planning and technology, because I wanna make sure when I'm saying those words, we're a little bit closer to talking about the same things, because I think they mean a lot of things to, to people, technology, democracy, public engagement. And then the timing of getting to work with you today is really cool. So I've been working on um, a short research report that's called Building Digital Governance Standards with Urban Planning Professionals. I'm gonna shake you down for help with this, if uh, possible, today. <laughs> um, but we asked two questions in this report. How is the urban planning profession currently responding to digital transformation writ large? So how are you as a profession dealing with technology? What does that look like in your practice? Now, and then, how might the profession respond in the future? So this is, we're gonna have two workshops uh, this afternoon. I'm so excited to spend some time with you during these workshops um, because we can think about this very practically, very tactically, tangibly. Um, what what is both our responsibility from within this profession and also like what are things that you haven't tried yet but you might be able to do um, in the future to figure out how to do better public engagement and also uh, stewardship of public assets. Um, two little notes before I get into it. When I say planning today, for me, from my experience, um, one thing that matters is I'm talking somewhat about the literal like registered planner profession. You know, like you have a professional association, you have a code of, I think that should say ethics, not conduct. Um, that's one thing that I'm uh, aware of, right? It should say code of ethics, right? Yes, I thought so, thank you. I know it was here and I'm like, no, I'm gonna leave it, let's be honest. I have code of conduct because I work in organizing a lot. Um, but that's the reg registered planning part. I might have actually Did I? No, cool, okay. I'm okay to like roll like this. Oh yeah, I'm good. Okay, so I'm also Italian. <laughs> so that's one piece. The second piece is when I say planner, I, I know there are planners who are professional planners that are actively not registered for various reasons. So that's one other set of planners that I know of. And then I've got this list here. So the adjacencies to planning are numerous and um, Let's keep them all in mind as we talk. I'm not, sometimes what I'm saying is very narrow, very, very narrow. Um, sometimes it's very broad. So that's that. And to move into the first piece of this, um, when I started to work on this report, I got on the telephone. I like the telephone a lot. And I called a few planners. And so one of the planners I spoke to works at a private practice in Toronto. And I said, 
what, how much do you think about technology in your work? And he was like, uh, not at all, not my problem. And I was like, that's true, <laughs> go on. Um, and basically saying it just wasn't, it wasn't in his mind, his process, and he said a lot of the stuff that you're talking about is actually more the city's problem, for example. So technically I know it's not within the professional planner's remit to have a strategy to deal with digital transformation. I understand that. Um, and it was good to hear it said to me. Another couple observations from people were transportation planning is probably the place with the most amount of uh, technology being infused into it and over time, like there's a lot of that going on. Um, and also an observation that in the last 10, 15 years, and particularly during the pandemic, the access to information for the public had increased so much. Websites were getting better. Documents were getting circulated. There was like different modes of people meeting. So these were some of the trends that I was hearing from the people that you know I was asking, do you think about this? Do you want to think about this? Um, hopefully that tracks. And these are the kinds of things I'm sure you have more to add. So basically, on democracy, I want to say that where I sit right now after the work I've done, if we're not moving more power to the publics, we're not going to get anywhere else than where we are right now. For me, I'm very tired of representative democracy. I do not believe that there is a party or a leader who is going to fall from the sky and resolve things for us, and they just need to get voted in. I don't believe there's any political ideology where, where power will not accrue to the few. So none of these things track to me. The only way things will change is if more people are more involved in a more consistent basis. That's my, that's my through line. If I'm not working on that, I'm not doing the work anymore. I'm like, whatever, if the project I'm working on doesn't answer that question, it's not good. Um, anyone here familiar with Eleanor Ostrom? Nice, okay. So I think as we're seeing even the most financial timesy conservative commentators acknowledging that capitalism and uh, neoliberalism are bringing us like increasingly close to very m numerous crises. Um, thinking about ownership as a concept r and moving that more to stewardship of things is I think a very helpful uh, transitory 50 year arc to think through. I don't think, this may sound, uh, what do you wanna call this? not enthusiastic about public finance. I don't think the public sector is going to be pouring billions of dollars into currently private assets. I don't think we're gonna get public infrastructures at the scale that we need them for the climate crisis. Unfortunately, I don't. So I think what we have to do to be pragmatic about that, I'd love to be wrong, by the way, like please let that be wrong, um, is increase our power to steward what is currently private. I've done this work with digital infrastructures or data, trying to put them in trusts so that people have more power to dictate the terms of use of a thing. That's where I've come from. But land trusts, anybody familiar with land trusts, right? So I think looking towards those models are great, but the three constraints I wanna really point out to us, because I talk about the commons, I think people here might be able to be like, yes, sounds great, love it. And then again, the pragmatism comes in, which is, when I talk about participating in a community um, engagement kind of process or self-governance, most people say to me, yeah, that sounds nice. People just want the government to work. They don't want to do what you're proposing they do. They don't. They do not want to spend two, three hours a week on things, you know, to manage things that should be managed for them. That's a reality, okay? That's like, that's right now. That's for real. I don't want to do that. Yet I know that that's a thing we have to do. Secondly, if we got that done and people were excited by it, there needs to be money to support the skills development to get people in a room to manage their assets. Self-governance is not intuitive. Power will again accrue in a screwy way, in a room for like 10 people, you get them in a room, it gets hard fast. So the skills of mediation, facilitation, process organization, those are vital skills. They do not exist en masse in this country, I can say that. I come from a very niche profession. This is not uh, common knowledge, how you set up good process. So let's think about how we do that in our planning work is important. And the third thing is, someone's gotta give the power to the public. How excited are leaders to do that? Not at all, <laughs> not at all. So thinking about people in electoral politics, who would pick up in their campaign that they would support land trusts. Like you need to get people to commit to these ideas because their political leadership is still a reality. 
we are still living in electoral politics world. So we have to take these things, because for me, I'm frustrated listening to people talk about, oh, the commons, yeah, this will be great. And it's like, yeah, except we got these three problems here. So I'm pointing those out specifically. We can think about it in the workshop. What do we do based on these constraints? And if you disagree with these, again, like would love to hear about that. Um, book recommendation, it's not here. This is a great book that talks about Eleanor Ostrom's work. These are questions, not gonna read them, but the kinds of questions that I think take this from an abstraction and into your everyday project planning and work. These are things you can do. You can do this on any kind of a project. You could do this on a, you know, on a public realm project. You could do this in a housing study. You can always be the person putting forward ideas for increased self-governance. So I don't know about any of you. I don't identify as an abolitionist. This is not an identity that I, that I walk around and say, I'm an abolitionist. However, a lot of the things that I believe in and work on are definitely pictured here. This is a, this is a set of eight principles for abolition. You see at the bottom, investing in community self-governance. So I say this to you because it's up to you how you identify politically, how you want to respond to defunding the police, how you wanna deal with some of the issues that are on this slide here. But it's a really good question to ask yourself is, can you respond in an adjacent way? You don't have to take this stuff on wholesale. You have to even ask, are you comfortable with this? Do you disagree with this? And can you still work beside it? Because I think what we also have to watch out for when we're trying to get to mass public power, we can't get hung up on, I don't like that language, you know? I don't think that's the right way to call it. I don't think we're like, you know what, we got problems here. We got a lot of bad things happening because of some of the history of our public institutions. We are, the police are not accountable to the public at the moment, full stop. That's a, that's a democracy problem. So just to consider that self-governance is not um, in another land away from some of this political work. And you can do your politics in your work without having to label yourself. That's fine, you know? Like, so you, I, I just put this out to you for your consideration because if we're not grappling with these things, I don't think we're rooting ourselves in what's, what's going on in the world right now. These are very important. These are uh, Ostrom's eight principles for managing a commons, just to give you a glimpse. So this is the 2009 Nobel Prize thinking. I think this is my last comment on democracy. No, one more. So. This is just to summarize my experience with rights. I hear a lot about rights. Rights to speech, rights to personal action, property rights, rights to, <laughs> I'm, not being, I'm not being very, there's not a lot of levity here. Rights to, like, you know, uh, the angular plane conversation, right? Like, what is your right to sunshine is a very real conversation that goes on. It's important. And it's also part of a larger set of discussions. So what I'm proposing through our discussion of public engagement today is you only have your rights because and a citizen and resident is different. As a citizen, you have responsibilities. Your responsibilities are very, very related to your rights. And I think narratively in the discourse we live in right now, free speech, all, the, all of the stuff that's going on, we're heavy on rights and we're very light on responsibilities. And people don't wanna hear that but this doesn't work. This imbalance is not working. It's not working. So we have to think how we blow up the size of the word responsibilities here. And I think this is a great example. I was watching a city council in Toronto. How many times I've watched someone come in and do a deputation and say, my friend died, you know, to, to the mayor, to whichever committee they're speaking at. My friend died. My other friend's probably gonna die. Housing is a human right, and the mayor sort of looks. It's like, yeah, it's true. But housing as a human right. There's no office of the human right. You can't in Toronto go somewhere. Hi, can I have my human right? Like, I need my housing, what's going on? What we don't have is infrastructure to support rights like that. Your, your rights are only as good as your access to them. We have no infrastructure supporting the idea of housing as a human right in Canada, zero. But if you listen to the story, you hear that, and it's like, yes, it's true. The people who have, in different First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities, 
dealt with some of the issues in court have been succeeding. Those fights are long. Like, how many of you want to participate in strategic litigation? Like, is that part of your career path right now? That's, when you're getting into stuff like this, that's the way you got to go. So what we have to acknowledge is we're using words that don't map to reality. So how do we get people access to their housing as a human right, right? We have to close these gaps because we're using words that don't track to our infrastructure. Just an example of um, governing together and some of this from technology. I wrote this piece with Zara Abraham about stewardship of public spaces. And it's cool because we talked about positive rule setting and the ideas of what can you do here, what should you do here, you know, in, in a space rather than what aren't you allowed to do. I always laugh when I see this picture because I went one day and put my feet in that fountain. And after I did that, lots of other people did. And I didn't know that maybe you weren't, like I wasn't sure why that did or didn't happen. But you need to give permission in some cases for how things are used. And I think we need to get out of the, like, you can't do X and get into the, what, do you, what should be done here? And if we collectively govern, we're more likely to get down those roads. I have a story about the same idea um, for internet access. The, uh, maybe we'll get into it in the Q&A. But I just wanted to point out that the um, technology is only something to talk about without an asterisk on it, if everybody has internet access and if everybody has digital literacy. So I'm about to move into technology. Not everybody has those things. Not everything is written in the languages it should be. Um, and we can come back to this, but I just wanted to share this saying because I love bringing knowledge to incentive fights. I think we're at the point in time where a lot of people love doing this. Like we know what we should do. We know how things should look. We know how housing would ideally be built. We know X, Y, Z. We also can't operate outside of reality, like highest and best use. That's about extracting value from land. I think a lot of us in this room know there's other things we want to do with land, but that's the paradigm in which you work. So we have to think about where do, what are the incentives to shift what the highest and best use of land looks like so it's for community in a different way than it is currently? I think that's an important question. I'll come back to this insurance point later. That's a fun industry to look for uh, places to make change. It really is. Um, in the city of Toronto, I have seen so many examples of the unicorn idea for urban technology. And I just want to offer that we're going to talk about technology in specific. Cities have, in the last 10 years, been so hell-bent on being a technology city that they're letting industry decide how cities should operate. And this is happening in every sector. It's happening in transportation. It's, hap it's, not the it's not like they're taking over with the unicorn or anything. It's not that. But there's a lot of influence in the idea because technology is both a sector and a tool. But technology doesn't have to be capitalist, and this is very confusing. But the narrative of we're, we're a tech-forward city, we're an innovation city, we do new things here. In Toronto, there's an American company called Pay It that won a tender to basically be the company through which all parking payments, all um, water payments, all of that money flows. They're taking points off of one of the largest assets that exists in North America's economy, which is our tax base, in terms of security and value. And that's, that money is even, go, never mind the American company part of the equation. We're not, we're basically using the city as like a, a finance capital here, which we've done through land, but now we're doing it through technology as well. And I just want to say it can be very difficult when you're fighting up a hill to say, this is a bad technology idea. But then you've got the head of economic development saying, yeah, but it's really good for the economy. And this basically summarizes the Canadian technology discourse all the way up to the most inane artificial intelligence things you may be reading in the newspapers. You see a hand. Well said. So that's a, that's a real, um, that's a real incentives shaped problem again. 
I'm not going to go through this completely. I just want to point out probably the most important thing I repeat over and over and over again, technology is not inevitable. It is not falling from the sky. It is not the future. It is not like it is none of these things. We have been chasing that myth for at least the last 30 years since the internet went mainstream. It's somehow it's just like, well, we just got to live with it. Oh, massive amounts of surveillance. Sorry, that's a feature of the future now, I guess. Like, no, no, it's not. But it's been very difficult for us to fight some of the norms of that. Because who wants to, and I've watched this with politicians, no politician wants to be understood. I, I am a very big fan of Luddites. If you look into a good political history, look at the Luddites. But politicians are terrified of looking like they're anti-innovation or they don't want to do the cool thing. So they're captured like this, like this. Easy, easy pickings. And all of us, have struggled with that consequence because we haven't been at the table for really significant decisions in technology history. Um, the only other thing I want to say explicitly, technology, you probably know this, like data, never neutral, generally accelerates any power imbalance, any software, pro anything you bring in with technology, if you're not watching that, you're going to just make things worse most of the time. Faster, slipperier, harder to understand how it happened, less accountability, does the term black box mean anything to people? You're getting handed products that you don't even know how they work because you're not allowed because it's proprietary intellectual property. But you're using them to decide how buses are going to be organized. Like, that's a democracy problem. So we have serious problems in how technology is organized and sort of ingested. So at 20 minutes left, I think I have to get to the like, so what do we do? Um, I'm really confident that the planning profession, if you are interested and have capacity, you are in one of the best positions to fight the most ridiculous elements of what's happening with technology and society because you do your work based on geography, reality, place, context. Data, big data, artificial intelligence, in the worst of it, I'm not going to get into how to define that right now, it operates by removing context. It takes context away, gloms it all together, makes patterns. And as a result, if you use some of these products, you're getting stuck in the past. You're going to keep repeating the patterns of before. You are working in the place where you can bring context, which is what our legal and justice systems are based on, to bear on how technology is used. Because multinationals and companies that write software for the city or any kind of product, they're not, they're not living in reality with the people who it impacts. I've sat around these policy tables. You want to talk to people in the abstraction. It's like technology policy at the national level. No one's talking about anything like here. So this fundamental piece of the profession, which grounds you in place and context, I think is a really encouraging um, leverage point. And I think the only other thing I want to say about technology, would you agree that if people talk about it, the one theme you hear is privacy? Would you say that that's what you hear for the most part? Okay. The flip side of that is surveillance. So when it's like the scary version of it, it's surveillance for good purpose. Um, privacy and surveillance are very real issues. They're old. They're well studied. We have decent scholarship on them. We've got two sets of laws in Canada. The problem is sometimes the questions aren't about privacy. Sometimes even if something is privacy preserving, it's a really bad idea. We have no legal infrastructure to manage that. I can give you examples later. But what we need to think about, which is not a privacy problem, is when our whole society is based on an efficiency paradigm. I've brought, got a few books here. It's the exact opposite thing that we need. We don't need frictionless efficiencies where you don't talk to human beings but you get your thing faster, and you get it from the government, you don't really talk to a person that delivers service anymore. That's the wrong way. We need to be going to the friction way. We need to talk to each other. When we're having uh, disagreements, we have to get into the mess. So it's just a suggestion, again, we can talk about tactics, but how you reject efficiency, because it's just speeding up. And that's when I said with power imbalances, if something's like quick, 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 um, you don't stop and think what's packed into the relationship anymore. That gets back to, I don't know for all of you, but you have to go slow to be kind. You have to. 
You have to be present with people. You have to listen. Like you really have to go at a different pace than our social norm. And technology is encouraging everyone to go faster. I have a receipt from Subway and someone has to remind me to tell you this story. It ha it's happening everywhere. Um, we'll get back to that. So how is the urban planning prof uh, profession responding to digital transformation now? This is my flying burrito that I promised. I had a friend in Australia call me and we'd been through a few different technology fights. Uh, she had worked on, her name's Julia, DeepMind, which was Google's foray into healthcare. I'd worked on Sidewalk Labs, which is Google's foray into cities. And then it could ping pongs back to her and she said, I can't do her accent properly, but basically like, Bianca, they're flying burritos around in drones. I was like, what are you talking about? And she was like, no, really, they're piloting burrito delivery with drones. And they're doing it in Australia because we have the most lax regulation. And okay, you know, like, uh, and so she's had to start to scramble and organize people who would have arguments as to why that's not a great idea to have b drones buzzing around delivering burritos. Like, like, is this, do we want this to be how we're setting social norms? I would argue no, but this is the vacuum in which these companies can operate because the planners aren't there. They're talking to the economic development people in Australia. They're not talking to the city planners. You see what's happening? So they're getting permission from the wrong piece of the state. So this stuff is all over the place. I just point to some examples. Um, this is technology sort of in the public realm. Um, this would be the example when I contacted the uh, urban planner who told me like this is not my problem, really, and again, technically he's right. But these are examples of things that are encroaching on public realm and really accessibility, like the sidewalk delivery robots, have you seen those? The minute a councillor in Toronto tried to object, it was like, oh, Toronto's no fun. Toronto's no fun, we're gonna do these fun, cute robots, which are, by the way, remotely operated by someone else, just for the labor component of how that magic works. Um, they're, they're there, and I'm not saying this in a way of the planning profession is not at the table, but it's not in a blame way. It's just like, we need you at the table. We need you at the table on some of these issues. Having robots on the sidewalk, that's an accessibility problem. It's a pretty obvious one, and it's pretty scary that the city's like, meh, this is pretty cool, we're gonna do it anyway. Um, then we've got technology that planners use in their practice. I really love this headline. <laughs> the, the fallout from Airbnb in cities. And then they come around after a decade being like, we're gonna give you data to help you with your planning now that we've like crunched significant amounts of your rentals um, through this model. That again, we didn't really get regulated properly because it was cool. Much like Uber, because it's so cool. Like, do you know how hard it is to understand that that is how those things happen? Like, this is me bringing knowledge to an incentive fight. You're like, oh, they just want to look and like support this industry. Um, so you've used technology in your work. It's like StatsCan, it's 100 years old. Data's not new to you, working with data's not new to you. But the, 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 the genesis of some of the data and the information is different. And so when you start using tools that you cannot explain to the person who's impacted by their use, you should, that should be a red flag for you. As an example, practically, if Google or Waze is being used in planning to make decisions, and you have a resident asking you, well, can you please explain the rationale here? And you say, I can't, actually, because it's proprietary. That doesn't jive with our Westminster accountability system in our government. Like, you're not supposed to be able to do that. So I'm pointing out to you that we have a regulatory problem here. Um, and I'm warning you because if you use these tools in your practice, you have to think, who are you accountable to? And how are you gonna answer their questions should you get them? Because you will. And I got lots of stories of this stuff going sideways. And then to get to today's um, topic and focus of our workshop, tech and public engagement, a Zoom public meeting is very, very different from a public meeting in person, as I'm sure anyone who's been to either can attest. But some of what is changed or has changed is very innocuous. Public meetings were typically not surveilled. They weren't recorded historically. Now, they are. 
If you don't understand that that puts a chill on speech, then you don't understand how that works. Surveillance makes people nervous. That was never raised. Of course we had to do a thing, understood. And yes, there was more people maybe able to access if they had the internet, but there's a flip side to that consequence. There's also a change in the dynamics. Some of the best things that are gonna to happen today are gonna to happen in the hallways. And you're gonna find your people and you're gonna you know, connect up and you're gonna keep fighting together and working together. That's really hard to do on Zoom, really hard to do. So the city used to be a convener of that kind of social connection and that kind of place where advocates could meet and others. And lastly, I think access to the planners change. On the projects I used to work at, they'd all be in the room and you could go and you can pick them off and like hold them accountable. Now the city can basically be like, I've got the mic and you're gonna have to go through me as your mediator if you wanna speak to a planner in specific. I don't know if any of you have found your experience went more were you more engaged on Zooms? Less? Same? I don't know. But the point is, it's not the same thing. And so you have to be careful when you get into these conversations where you're doing, um, you know, put, put something, substitution as though it's, the, it's not. Even if more people are there, but the, the dynamic change is net, net. Is it better or worse? Unclear. Um, I wanted to show you a project that I work on as a volunteer. I will not get into it, but if you're interested, um, this is called Polis. It is uh, probably, I would put it at the front of what would be called cutting edge digital participation um, technology. It is machine learning. It's down the road of artificial intelligence. And uh, they've been working on this tool for about 10 years-ish. It was used in uh, Taiwan significantly for people to write legislation for Uber um, as one case. What's really cool about this software is it lets people see where they agree on things and where they disagree, and it groups them. And it's really cool, and it lets people put, um, when it says down here, I feel that UberX is not currently operating legally, which makes me feel risky when taking a ride. It lets people who participate put statements in, and then everybody else can sort of agree, disagree, or add their own. It's not perfect. I don't think this is anything that you would just, you know, slap into a public consultation and walk away, but it's definitely interesting. And I stay involved with, with the people working on this because in some cases they completely terrify me. And I say that kindly and we say that to each other. Um, like these are people who will like, no, if someone can make me watch an Elon Musk video, I care about them, okay? That's a thing that has happened recently because of our work together. And I say this with love. Um, there's a lot going on in technology, but it needs more public and more plan. It needs the people who know the profession to be involved in how these tools are used. Because as you can see in artificial intelligence debates, even that word being used is not healthy for us. <laughs> so even though tools can automate things or help us see each other and they can be beneficial, wow, do you have to be careful? Wow, 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 do you have to be careful? And so for me, it's a matter of always keeping a lot of humans um, in the loop. There's a military, much technology came from military and defense budgets, probably know this. In the military, there was a set of sayings called human in the loop, human on the loop, human out of the loop. Those are the three, if you're managing um, defense, those are the three modes of engagement with automated systems. So either you're totally out of it, you're totally like managing it, or you're somewhere responsible for it. And the terms of that can be um, Discuss, but I want to share that with you because a journalist wrote a great piece about automated uh, cars. Automated, I, I, I dislike the whole thing so much, I'm not even saying the right word, but Teslas. And they talked about the driver being the moral crumple zone. And the reason they were the moral crumple zone was the car is going by itself, except when it's about to hit someone, and then over to you. Okay? So you're involved. So, I mean, you're not driving the car, but then you are. But then if something bad happens, it's on you. You got it? I'm not going to be, like, resting easy in a car like that. But they use the human in the loop, on the loop, as the moral crumple zone. Oh, you weren't paying attention. We told you it's not perfect. We told you it's not working 100% of the time. And then this is how people have to spend their attention. And you can take this into all sectors of our society and how the labor implications of this kind of stuff. So I think online meetings 
might seem like a mundane example of public engagement, but I actually think there's a ton of interesting conversations to have about that and how to do them better online. Um, social media, whole other thing. Maybe we'll talk about that in our Q&A. Um, there's, just, there's just a different set of tools, and I think the, the thesis here is don't take something out of a box and plunk it into your thing. I think you all know that. But what I've also learned practically is there's no budget for the person who has to manage those tools when a city puts an RFP out for a public consultation. You're, you're not allowed to spend tens of thousands of dollars on technology implementation. There's no line item for that. And that's why a lot of these things just go. They get used, no one's really being thoughtful about it. So in our workshop, I'd like us to think a bit about making these things better in their practice, because I think they have utility, but oh my God, you have to be careful. <laughs> you really have to be careful. And I can imagine how enthusiastic everyone feels about like adding that to the other work they have to do in a contract, right? Like this is the problem, this is how stealth works. Everybody's got something else, and honestly, it's important what they're doing, the other thing. So these tools are here, they can be beneficial, they really require care and attention. Um, we're gonna mostly get into this, I think, in our workshop, but there's a few proposed approaches here um, just in terms of thinking about these issues over the course of the long term. Even just a couple people bringing up some of these things to a professional association and saying, hey, could we maybe spin up a working group about this? Or should we talk about what um, technology terms I keep hearing and don't know what they are? The cloud. You know, like there's stuff that can be done within existing organizing for the professional associations that you may be part of. And I know a lot of groups don't have those. But there's, there's ways to do this work, I think, incrementally. Um, I think connecting some of these questions and their implications to, because to work you do on reconciliation, to addressing anti-black racism, to like the work you do tends to have a connection to technology that has to be made in some way. So you don't feel like you're adding something on. You're just continuing the work you're doing and getting a little more aware of how technology can be implicated in that work. Like, you know, we have to think about how we're not just adding on a whole new set of work for everybody. We don't have time, that's what I'm talking about with capacity. So we have to make these things more coherent and that's sort of why I'm here today is after, I don't know how long now, the public just as a um, general public has no shot stopping, and I, this is not dismal or anything, this is history the forces of private capital with technology. The big tech companies, and we know what, who they are, their influence in Canada is incredible. It's all private infrastructure. We don't even own the computing capacities for artificial intelligence in the ways that the big tech companies do. So we, we don't even have it. We don't have the stuff to hand. So it's all private in some of the most fastest moving spaces. So I think the next strategy is, rather than try to round people up to fight technology, it's to round people up in all the places they already are. That's how we're going to be successful with this work. And that's going to take a long time. But I think that's the road forward. Um, so these are some questions we can step through later. Getting back to these particular ideas, um, I have some books here because some of these concepts, I think, have done me so much um, help over the years. One of them right here, I don't know if you've heard of this book called The Public and Its Problems by John Dewey. It's probably almost 100 years old. His big point is there's no such thing as public. It's always publics. So this idea that you're working in the public interest in your code of ethics, like which publics? Which ones? Who, who exactly are you talking about here, you know? And we have to get used to making things plural. I mean, when you talk, when you write something, catch yourself. Are you saying proposed solution or proposed solutions? Are you making room for pluralism? White supremacy and eugenics are two words that give people a big like, whoop. We would be so lucky if white supremacy was like riding around with KKK uh, gear on. Like that's, that's a piece of the story. The majority of white supremacy and its implications are very mundane. Tons of administrative violence, tons of institutional violence. It's boring, that's why it's so hard to move. And we have to figure out how we shake out some of that through shoving power to publics who believe that we should be shaking this up because these institutions have shown themselves it's not gonna change in a closed circuit. I think we need to make peace with that and mourn it a little bit if we need to. It's not going to happen. We have had representatives 
in power where they're supposed to be representing people that are not themselves, we're not there, we're, we're, we're not there, right? We're not getting to the places we wanna to get to, I think, as people and as a country. So we just really offer, these things can be broken down into very small pieces and indeed, that is how the change will happen. You don't have to become an activist. You don't have to march in the streets. You don't have to. You would be great if you can support it. If you're, if you're comfortable, cool. You can do very important work adjacent to the people in the streets. And you should be doing it. And you don't have to reinvent yourself. You don't have to become a revolutionary. It's actually that you need to use your positional power in concert with the people who are making it very clear that they will not outsource um, their conscience anymore to say, well, this is a consensus, this amount of death is okay. Like that's on all of us, right? I think we have to hold that a little closer to how we live every day and understand how it might look different um, to, to bring it into your work. This thing's gonna be very loud in a second. So there we go. My most important thing to say now is, please disagree with me. Please challenge me. Please tell me I got stuff wrong, okay? Because that's what I'd like to model that we can do. Thank you. I've got, uh, Thank you so much. thank you, Marcus. And I, I should note, I, um, I have some readings that I can post, should they be of interest. I brought some books during the course of the day. I'll lug them around and uh, we can talk about them. But yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much. And we have um, time now, uh, about uh, 30 minutes for questions and discussion. Um, and uh, in the spirit of what you were talking about, I should say we are being recorded, but it's not live. Um, and if you do ask a question and you're not comfortable it being in the feed, just let me know and we'll edit it out after, because I really want to make sure people feel comfortable asking questions without knowing it's going to be all over the internet if you don't want to. That's a very good point. That's good consent culture, as we call it. And take it seriously. And honestly, I'd much rather talk to you in the room. If, you're, if you'd rather have a harder conversation, you're embarrassed. And, or, I mean, should I just say maybe we shouldn't record the questions? I don't know. How do people feel? Anybody got a question? <laughs> Anybody got a challenge? Oh, yeah, lots Please. of questions. Yeah, bring it on. Oh, bring where it do on. I go? Where do I go? Okay, circulate around. <laughs> yeah? And also teaching. Like, if you have a comment, that's great. Or if you have something to, to teach me and everybody else, do that too. Please, this is supposed to be that as well. Hi. <laughs> Thank you uh, for your keynote. Uh, my name's Vitu. I have a question, a follow-up question about your flying burrito. Uh, story. So you mentioned that your friend uh, went to gather feedback from planners as to why the flying burrito was not a good idea. What was some of the feedback that she heard from those planners? So I want to be careful with her story because I think she was talking to a range of people. But some of the things that she heard back were related to, number one was noise, which reminds me of um, working on electric trains. Like the, the, the difficulty of talking about noise and intermittent noise, but that you should have you know, that noise pollution is a thing. So we have to think about that. And then safety is another one because what is the regulation? What else is in the sky? What's going on? Um, conflicts. Um, I think those were the two primary ones. And my um, suggestion was also just to um, watch out because, and I think, I think they already got onto this. The smart thing to do from the corporate side is to say, we're also delivering medicine. <laughs> which I'm pretty sure came up. So there's a lot of rhetorical things too. So it's just like trying to get ahead of that and thinking like, hold on, how do we protect that need? You know, like if, you, if it is delivering medicine, how would you separate that out from burritos and coffee? So those, yeah, no problem. Those, those are the ones that are top of mind from what she shared. So ahead. After the swearing, there was a lot of swearing. I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell a subway receipt story. Oh my God, thank you. See how this works? See how this works? I love it. And I can't look at my forensic, like I'm gonna keep this receipt. Um, so I was driving from Toronto yesterday. I was very hungry. And I went to a subway after I, <laughs> this is not the part of the story. I end up on the blue highway instead of the green highway a lot. So I got off the blue highway and I got a sandwich. And when I came in to order the sandwich, the guy working at Subway, and I think he was the owner is my guess, he's like, do you like turkey? And I'm like, I know I said, can I get a turkey sandwich? And he says, uh, look at the board. So I looked at the board and I was like, uh, and he suggested a number. 
And then I uh, was like, yeah, that sounds good. I'm like, can I get double cheese? And, and he's like, it was perfect. He's like, it has double cheese. <laughs> I'm like, yes. So we were like, it was like, it's something, something's going right here. And then at the end of the line, he says to me, and he, and he gets his marker out, and he puts a number three on my sub. And I looked at his t-shirt, and it had like something to do with numbers. And basically what he was trying to train me to do was to come in the next time and say, can I get a number three? That's turning people into, that's how computers work. That's how computers work. Like you can really much more easily automate becoming the number three button. And I also thought it was interesting because in like a different restaurant, you want the person to say, I want a Big Mac, right? Like you wouldn't want to erase the thing. I'm like, is Subway that grandiose in its world of the thing that they're like, I'm just gonna take the numbers in this industry. And I say this because this is like such a specific example of efficiency culture, is I don't want to go in there and say three and then go back to what I was doing. That doesn't help me because I'm paying attention to the person I'm talking to. And he was proud to talk about his sandwiches, which is perfect. Like that's what I think we should try to retain. And if you're not copping to the fact that it's now a campaign on his t-shirt to get people to say the number, something's going on here. I know this is like recency bias. Like it could be like, okay, they're just numbers on the sandwich, buddy. Like this isn't a conspiracy of numbers. This is just an observation um, of what is very much efficiency culture. It's, it's not the way I think we should be going is my point. Is it helpful maybe one day and maybe I'll be in a rush and super hungry and happy to say three, maybe. But it's also like, does anyone else do the grand rebellion at Starbucks? I don't drink a lot of Starbucks, but it's always just like medium. That's what I do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's the story. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, Rob. Now we'll get Matt. You had your hand up. I'll get over there. Great. Thanks, Bianca. Um, I like number threes. I prefer fives. <laughs> um, See, and then there's new labor. I have to check out what five is next time. Yeah. There. Okay. So um, that was really great presentation. Um, Thank you. I have a question for you. I'm not sure how to ask it, but I include myself in this criticism of our profession. We're fraught with jargon, run-on sentences, elegant ways to say things and to avoid them, uh, amongst other th things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how much of the solution is focusing on the quality of our message to each other? So strong bias toward it's very important to me because I think um, language, especially in a culture that is so written language dominant, like efficiency culture pushes out oral culture, unfortunately. I'll, I have a, this might feel like a little bit of a tangent, but I hope it gets us there quick enough. Um, I, used to, I, I still use telehealth. It's not called that anymore. But I, I noticed something in my early days of using telehealth where I would call and I'd be like, hey, hey, how are you doing? You know, like, like me talking, as you can imagine. And they're like, yep, yeah, good. What do you want? Basically, not exactly. But it started to, it, like, I, it clocked with me that their job rating was dependent on them being fast. So I was counter incentivized to be normal with that person because then I was like, oh, I want you to get a good rating. So then I'm like, bleh, bleh. so I turn into a robot because I want them to get a good mark on their survey. The compression of time that we have together to use our language together, because it's compressing ever more quickly, I think it makes it that much more important to focus on language and to talk, like the woman that I learned so much of my facilitation from, her name's Nicole Swern. She works with um, her partners at Third Party Public. Uh, you know, she'd be like 45 minutes into, into a conversation just, and she'd just look at everybody and be like, can you just say it normal? Like, just say it normal. Like, say it, just, <laughs> just say it. Um, and that's not easy. And I think we also have a lot of professions where I learned this with software engineers. If they would, I worked with a real, perfect stereotype set of like the software developers were German, the product manager was in New York, the operations guy was in France. It was like, it was a perfect storm of constant, like it was a comedy show and we could all acknowledge it. So the German, so for me, I had to re decide when software was like working. Every six weeks, sign off, liability, whatever, is it working or not? And the software engineers would just be like, no, this isn't ready to ship this is not ready to go, like it's not, and here, here, here's the problems. And they could never round off. It would be, it would just start to get so big and scary. 
they weren't trying to be inaccessible. They were trying to do their job well. So I think like the, there's so much reason for jargon and there's so much, you talk about safety and engineering and like the consequences of all of these things. So it's tough, you know? And I think finding the difference between when someone's hiding complexity, like I, I was, there was something online the other day talking about how power thrives in complexity. And I can say this from a public engagement perspective with technology, it's absolutely true. Because people just get scared off and then they don't participate. So I think it's a balance, but I think it's hugely important. I really, really do. And I, I wish we had more of that inefficient time together to practice our language with each other. The last thing I'll say, um, I am 44, so I defer to telephone calls. I don't know if everyone who's 44 does that, but um, I don't like writing stuff because to me, you lose tone when you write and you can be misunderstood in a flash. And if someone wants you to be misunderstood, you can get extra misunderstood in a flash if there's someone who sort of benefits if you're not saying it right or well. So again, telephone or anything where you have a tonal response, where you can increase the number of times you look at each other and like, are you getting me or no? Or is, am I saying something, is it like wrong? Whoa, you're making a face, what is it? Like is it good, bad, unclear? That back and forth is so critical to finding the language that allows you to move through, dif like, through difference. And so I think we have to be so cognizant of when we move things online into text, into writing, into surveys, into polls. For me, again, going the wrong way culturally, but it's efficient, but it's not gonna get us to shared language in any kind of a, a, a good manner, I don't think. I'd love to hear people be like, nope, these are all the reasons. And I know that some of the reasons written culture can be very beneficial and there's power relationships to that too. So it's not, you know, this is where my positionality comes into play, but I'm just sharing a bit of my thinking on that. Matt, and then there, and then Sean, and then the other Sean. <laughs> Um, f f again, thank you very much for this presentation. It was very informative. Um, one of the things that uh, rang, uh, that rang, I actually got a couple comments. Um, one of the things that rang in my mind uh, when you mentioned the, the privatization of infrastructure and all that kind of stuff is the digitization of money. And when you think about it, prior to the pandemic, it was still commonly acceptable to pay to pay for for goods and services with cash. Yes. So, so, be, so which it, which is in paper or coinage that is issued by the Bank of Canada. Ever since the pandemic, a lot of company, a lot of a lot of businesses have switched over to accepting debit or credit cards only. Even the university is doing this. But you got to keep in mind that. That the debit cards for to get a debit card, you need to have an account with a bank with one of the big banks, and for the credit cards, you need to have an account with a credit card company and whatnot. So, do you not think that it's kind of concerning that people who do not have access to who do not have access to those kinds of accounts, um, whether it be because whether it be because of uh, their financial means and whatnot, are effectively shut out of shut out of certain businesses and all that? It's a disaster. You know who else did that? Via Rail. It's all, over, it's all over the place. It's a disaster. Yeah. I had a, uh, and then I'm going to do a facilitator move, and hopefully Marcus is okay with it. Given that there's other people that have stuff, can we go to them and come back to you after? Yeah, yeah. As a, yeah, yeah. Be a cool. But that's, I'm so glad you raised this, and I'm going to try to remember what I was about to say. I just, like, switched over to this other thing. So, but what a huge point, and thank you. This is why I'm grateful for us doing this conversationally. So kind of in the same vein of some of the other questions, engagement goes down when the cameras go on. Yeah. And so we're doing that currently. Yeah. I'm a, a student that's returned, and so many of our committees, societies, social clubs, and everything are moving online, potentially because it's easier, it's quicker, they can circumvent people, and we're losing the tone. And I'm finding myself struggling to say we really need to engage, especially now that we're coming kind of in as strangers after being away from the pandemic, regardless of what year you're coming into. So I just want to know if you had any thoughts or toolkits or resources or something in your book list that yeah. I can really quickly and easily bring to, in particular, societies. To me, societies are on the ground yeah. and really should be looking us in the eye, engaging with the students to keep us involved. Because when we're involved and we're engaged and we're uh, accountable to each other, all this other stuff has a greater chance of, 
of succeeding. 100%. The, the, the number one piece of advice I can give to you is you would be surprised how many people agree with you and you need to say it and then you need to like move it through because people understand this thing that you're, that you're talking about. I've had to fight people away from radical transparency where everything is note taken, everything is transcribed. Like when I used to work on public meetings, we didn't do perfect transcription. We took the spirit of what was said and that was intentional because those things, not only is it bad in the moment, it gets worse after if you start then going back to historical record. And so I think the most important thing to do is to voice the concern and say, we're losing these things that are absolutely, and take it, like be serious about it. This is basic to our self-governance. This is basic to our relationships and power. And I also think like you have to, it's, it's hard to make this seem like it's a big deal. It's a massive deal. Like it's so good to hear you say it. And I think you just have to keep repeating it. And it looks like you have a follow-up thing to say. Like there's like three, sorry. There's, no, it's great. There's it's great. Three, three years now of generational students that are coming in that are missing on that, on that momentum. And so it's one of those things like student council, our staff, our everyone, it's like, it's, it's one of those areas everyone needs to lean into, yep. have, it, have it change. And then I wanna say two things to that. Firstly, because I got that compelled with your point, just after I said, you can only talk once. I'm like, no, please go talk twice. Like, no, I'm being self-aware right now. We'll come back to you too. And it's, I think the reason, um, the reason I, I wanted you to keep talking was to help me keep talking, which is to say, one of the most interesting things to me about abolition is that you don't give up on people, that you don't ever throw anyone away. And the only way to have the kind of a place where you can make mistakes, screw up together, do harm, be forgiven, maybe not be forgiven, but you still exist and you have to live somewhere in society comes to keeping those relations together, you know? And I think we have to acknowledge that people are terrified of the consequences of misstepping because of how much surveillance culture we've ingested. Email, man. I would get emails from people working in the governments and I would think, you're writing this down? <laughs> Were you trained in freedom of information? Huh? When you came into the public service, like what are you doing, man? You know what I mean? Like this is, we're not, I, I don't think we are, have grappled with how deeply surveillant our norms are. And then your email from 17 years ago that you thought you deleted, whatever, right? <laughs> like, the, so obviously, emphatically, I think we have to protect and support and invest in that time together. And I think these are all these kinds of reasons. Not a toolkit, but I think if you think about and read about surveillance culture, it's the kind of thing that you can use um, practically to, to advocate for what you're advocating for. Bianca, I like your idea of collecting questions because we got lots of hands up and only, is that okay with you if I, we'll kind of go through it? Yeah, however, however. Sean, Sean, and then San over there. And then, yes. Hi, Bianca, thank Hi, you. Hi, Hi. <laughs> nice to see you, talk to you later. Um, <laughs> yes. Maybe, maybe it's my hopeless naivety here, but does, does, do we have to play along with tech? I mean, does, does tech need us more than we need it? Could we just disengage and, and, and not play into it? So, um, like me answering, as I often do, answering an email with a phone call, for example, ordering a sandwich by its, you know, a superstar basketball player <laughs> name as opposed to its number, right? Yeah, yeah. Kind of like opting out. Yeah. Um, anyway, some thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah. So am I supposed to be remembering what I'm going to say to these things? Yes? Dangerously okay. I, I so, think, I, I think. think. You, I, think you, uh, I think you suggested that I was into this, Marcus, but I'm into it. I'm into it. I can do it. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. Uh, great talk. Uh, Thank you. I have an anecdote and a question, unfortunately. The anecdote okay. is that I actually <laughs> recently, a historian colleague and I, wrote a paper about the Luddites. Um, they didn't write anything down. Their OPSEC was fantastic. It is hellish to try and write an article about the opinions of the Luddites because they were so good at not writing things down. 
Um, Look, here we are. Yeah. Perfect. But here we I are. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. Um, the the question is, so uh, I think a lot of us, I mean, I was very excited by the presentation. I loved how you started off with Ostrom talking about the commons and creating space for that. Uh, one of the things I, I struggle with, and I'm a professor here, not in planning. I teach in economic development, so I'm part of the problem in a very different way. Um, <laughs> Thank you for uh, the acknowledgement. <laughs> uh, is, is, you know, teaching about commons and self-governance and all the tools and skills to do that at an institution where as a professor I'm collecting the research, I am giving it sage on the stage style often to my students who then will take those buckets of information water and spread them around the world and make change because we've given them the right answers. Yeah. Um, how, do we, how do we square the circle on that? Like how do we actually pedagogically, um, and not just there, I mean we're also, campuses are uninviting, town and gown relationships usually look less like a collaboration and more like a suicide pact. Like how do we, <laughs> How do, we, how do we use the universities as a leverage point to enable self-governance when we seem to be so structurally in the opposite direction of that? Love this question and observation because I, I, I only have my undergrad and boy did I have an arc of like, oh, the universities, oh, the universities. <laughs> uh, but I still believe. Morning, Bianca. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I feel like I could relate on many, many levels, um, but I loved also how you ended with uh, this opportunity to challenge you. So I'll, in I'll introduce a challenge. Beautiful. Um, so I, and the challenge is around, you You have a theme around uh, sort of being against efficiency and a theme about we have to go slow to be kind. And I'll give you a couple examples where I think those kind of counter, they're against each other. Um, but first, for just a little bit of context, when I say I can relate, I can relate on both sides of the fence, if there is a fence, uh, as well as being the fence. <laughs> In that I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm an alumnus of the school. I'm, I consider myself to be an urban planner. Uh, I also work, have worked and currently work in tech, and I've also been a, a public engagement consultant. So okay. all three sides of that. Right on. Uh, so my challenge, my examples of the challenge are, uh, for example, when you think about the TTC and what TTC has done in moving to a lot of electronic fare payments, taking their collectors out of the booth, that means, you know, when you don't really need the help, you can go to the efficiency. And when you really need the help, now we've, we've put the human in front of you to, to be helpful. Uh, and then the other example, I've, you know, I've done work in what we call mobility as a service, and I can't tell you how many times I've stood up at the front of the room pitched a wonderful solution that we should be able to trial. And the very first question that people ask is, well, what about this like 1% over here of a person who doesn't have a mobile phone? Which I feel holds us back from trying something that will help many, many people until we have the solution for every single person in the world. Yeah, um, so yeah, that's yeah. Those are great, thank you. Maybe is that enough, or that, is that uh, getting the limit of collecting there, Bianca? No, you can keep going. Oh, keep going? Okay. Yeah. Um. All right, getting my steps in for the day here. All right, let's jog <laughs> up the hill. Um, okay, so thank you for the presentation. I really liked how you frame things like from rights to responsibility. I think that's very relevant um, to today because um, I, that is a huge piece of, you know, you can have rights, but you need, also need to be responsible for those rights and when, what you're given. Um, but I think another component of that is um, like I heard throughout the theme and I think the one slide on, on policing really kind of triggered me because um, I have worked with police services and I know one of the things I learned so much in, in a role working with them and I came to really respect the work that they do in protecting us um, and also kind of what they shared with me was like, you know, we don't trust them but they don't trust us either, like as a public because they've seen so much. Um, they put themselves through, you know, so much harm and risk to protect us and so I think there's a level of respect for police that I just wanted to put out there today too. Um, but there's this whole issue of trust that like kind of comes through with that. And so yeah. I think like with the rights and responsibilities for people to take on more responsibility, there's a liability to that. So how does the trust piece weigh in um, to, you know, having people be more responsible, but if they're now responsible, then there's a liability to that. So I think just again, like wanted to reiterate like, Police do a lot for us. They are out there putting their lives on the line, protecting us. So just that respect for, for what they do. It's not perfect. You know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But 
um, yeah, just interested in your take on that trust piece. Yeah. Um, and that goes, like, that's the foundation for building relationships, I think. And I know yeah. your work talks about that. So yeah. I'd love to hear your, your take on that and just the liability component. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And thank you for sharing that. We'll take two more questions and then we probably just have to get to Okay, it. and I'll, I'll do as best I can to do lightning speed answers. And Bianca, like thanks that. for your presentation. Uh, a, a lot of items to think about. A couple of things came to my mind, though, as you spoke, um, uh, as to um, me specifically in responding to some of these technological innovations, if you want to call them that. Yeah. Um, one, it, one relates to generations. It's a generational thing with respect to uh, cohorts, in my view, um, communicating only by technology. And I know a lot of people that do that and they expect an immediate reply versus slowing that pace down and having yeah. a conversation. Yeah. And uh, I'd just be interested in some of your thoughts with respect to how we cope with that yeah. uh, through the d different age groups. And secondly, um, uh, and you're probably uh, very wise in this area, with respect to legal ramifications of what we're using. Yeah. How many times do uh, all of us get uh, a piece of a program or something to deal with and uh, we sign off on the terms and conditions? Don't even know what they mean. Yeah. And uh, where can that get us? Yeah. And just for specificity, you, Marcus, before you move, when you talk about the technologies, these, like terms and conditions, do you mean in planning practice or just generally? In practice, planners. Like, Perfect. Uh, yep. Good. You know what I mean? Yep. Just checking. Thank you. And that's what they're being uh, uh, sort of taught, uh, I think, uh, through the university programs, et cetera, because you're getting a lot of the research being done in this area that's generating um, technological innovation and better ways to do things or find cures or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, there's a spin in this direction that it's, it's, it's hard to pull it back. Yep. Lisa, last question. Okay. I just wanted to introduce the idea that there's a couple of engineers in the room. Yes. And uh, probably the engineers in the room are not those who wholeheartedly believe technology will save us, but we would acknowledge we have a higher percentage of those than other professions. Um, and this sort of idea of what can universities do really resonates with me. Yeah. And I think that there's been a theme through your, your talk, which was great, about you know the responsibilities of being a professional planner and there's responsibilities of being a professional engineer and being a lawyer. Um, but I, I think that maybe something universities can do is, you know, we think of this breadth of knowledge and the in-depth knowledge. And there's a real need for in-depth knowledge, yeah. including in planning. You know, you had a big list on your early slide about people who play in planning, but there's yeah. a need for depth in planning. Yeah. And I think what something universities can do is identify the people who are capable of being this sort of um, the ambassadors and the interpreters between fields and between groups, yes. and they're very important to the, the pluralist society you're talking about. Yeah. And just not everyone can do that. Yep. But if we as universities could identify those people in first year and then give them the right type of training, we could change them out. We could send them out as more powerful change agents, but I don't think we do that. I think universities are stuck in this model where we're training in our individual fields, or we sort of go far too far the other way and start trying to turn everybody into um, these interpreter people and, and we need to respect that not everybody can do that. We need to sort of train change agents. Yeah. I think you made a very good argument for that work. So I, I think I have little to add to that because I agree. Um, Marcus, how much time do I have to answer these questions so we stay on track? <laughs> In theory or in reality? In reality. Um, well, let's, uh, if we can do five minutes, that would be great. Because um, lunch will be waiting. I sound like my grandmother today, trying to feed I'm everybody into it. all the time. Okay, ready? Um, going to set the clock. Yeah. All right, you got timers. I love this. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for the wonderful questions. I mean, and the conversation, of course, will continue. But It's, it's really at five. Okay, and it totally will continue. Um, the first one, resisting tech, does tech need us more than we need it? I would love to say that we can resist it in the way we have to date. The problem is by not participating, it's running rampant. But refusing it is so important. And that's why I talk about that abolitionist stance and some of it, some of it isn't, oh, is it privacy preserving or is it cheap or is it free to the city? It's a bad idea. So we're not gonna do it. And the city needs to hear that from the planners. 
They do. They need people to show up, and I need people to have the confidence to go against this nonsense that gets sold to cities because the politicians love the tech fixes because then they don't do the long-term capacity investments in the boring things like transit or, you know, like boring, you know, like boring bike lanes, boring. They want to do the announcement. So I think it's yes to resisting it, but I think it is going to require a different mode of showing up. You know, it does not mean let's get involved in all of it and give it credence. I think planners need to rip the credence off of a lot of the nonsense that gets sold. And you're the best position to do it to the point of the depth of expertise. I only, like sometimes I've got my whole chest out saying this is stupid in my head. I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's stupid. Like it seems pretty stupid, but like it would be helpful to know, you know, maybe to 100% on that. Um, okay, second thing, um, the challenge on the um, banking model of education, as I would call it. I brought this one book here, if you heard of it, Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks and pa pa Paolo Freire, who's um, a lot in this book too. I think that's a long-term culture shift, man. Like, I think you just gotta practice it. And I think about making space. One of the biggest things the university can add to any community is meeting space. Libraries are not even that accessible. So I think we gotta figure that out because you have insurances that maybe can expand and give people these vital places to meet in person. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, in terms of the challenge to efficiency, I like to talk about pro-social efficiency, which is like efficiency is not inherently bad, but what are you making efficient, right? Like are you making access to justice efficient? Cool, like that is not happening right now. Um, so I think it's really good to put some friction on like, is efficiency always bad? No, no it's not. But you have to actively design for, pro I call it pro-social is probably captured by some Elon Musk-esque character right now, so just be careful with that word. But um, there are ways to be efficient. This thing I have with Elon Musk is long-standing problem of like probably the most personified person of like, what are you doing and why is everyone writing about it? Like it, for planners, right? Like it's. Um, so good challenge, and I think like good examples that you shared. Um, so I think that's the uh, first thing. The second thing I wanted to say about this is um, I've been advocating recently for redundancy. I would love to see an act in Canada, which is you're able to get your service delivery through a non-digital uh, track if you want to to protect the investment for people who don't have the cell phone, that they have a very good, equally quality experience. But if you have the cell phone, do it. The best example of this is ArriveCan. Anyone use that? Shouldn't have been mandatory, but if you like it, if you like it, cool. But you should have also been able not to use it. So I think that's the answer to like addressing that. Um, now I've got really hairy ones for the next three. So I'm gonna say very quickly, on trust in the police, why don't we start with reducing lethal, uh, why, don't we, why don't we take their guns away as a starting point for trust? That's an iterative suggestion because they, all the work that is happening that is not resulting in non-lethal violence, I hear you, but also we have a trail of dead people and primarily racialized people in Canada and that needs to be important enough that we take a piece of the puzzle out that they're accountable for that kind of death, you know? So I think, like, to, to hear the point, and then there's ways through here. It's not all or nothing, you know? So I think that's how you build trust, is you take away the components that seem to be the most devastating to life and to their remit to us. And then, you know, keep evolving and adapting. That's sort of my response, um, like this off the cuff. I'd love to pick this conversation up, because I know there's a lot there. This is when doing something fast is not great. This is a bad efficiency, but I'm just trying to pull it off. Um, I think generationally, my God, I think by the time you've exchanged emails, you're, if you would have done it with letters, you would have had a better work outcome. I think we're actually going backwards by using email for the most part, and it's only getting worse with Slack and stuff. I tried, got to like, what, what did I get, a B, B minus? That's, that sort of tracks for me. I'm a pretty B minus-y person. So I would love to pick up on the rest of these. I have to stick to my commitment to keeping us on program and on track. So I just cannot thank you enough for the thoughtfulness in the conversations. And we'll finish these questions independently if you're around. And let's get to our workshops and do fun things together. Thank you.